Hello. Today we are going to discuss about what does your Parkinson doctor need to know to treat you better and to have a better outcomes. My name is Luis Saya, physical therapist, movement disorder specialist located in Knoxville, Tennessee. Before discussing our topic today, let me start defining what is a movement disorder specialist. Many people don't know that this specialty in neurology exists. Medicine actually is getting more and more complex every year and neurology is getting very specialized as internal medicine, uh, orthopedic surgery and many other specialties in medicine. In neurology, we have multiple specialties um, or fellowship such as vascular neurology, neurocritical care, headaches, neuromuscular disorder, sleep disorders, and many others. Let me put this in, uh, in this way. If I have a joint inflammation process, I would like a rheumatologist to take care of my joint problems. If, I, if I'm going to have a back surgery, spine surgery, I would like a fellowship trained neurosurgeon or an orthopedic surgeon to perform my surgery. The same thing apply if I have Parkinson. If I have Parkinson, I would like a Parkinson doctor, I mean a fellowship trained neurologist in movement disorder to take care of my Parkinson related issues. So what movement disorder specialty, specialist really is? So, is actually a neurologist with an extra training, fellowship training, one year, two years, depend how much research you, you do, in Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders, such as tremors, shakiness, walking problems, incoordination, which means ataxia, uh, abnormal posturing, uh, which means dystonia, uh, jerks, uh, myoclonus, and dance-like movements, or ticks and many others. In other words, we are specialized in anything that moves abnormal. Now that we understand what is a movement disorder specialist or a Parkinson doctor, let's start our topic today. The question here is, what does your Parkinson doctor need to know to treat you better and to have a better outcomes? you actually really can help your doctor to be more efficient. And the first step is to be on time. It's very important, why? Otherwise you will cause the domino effect. Other patients will get affected. Um, and remember, we have other patients next to you, after you uh, with similar problems and conditions. Just to give you an idea, um, typically in a neurology clinic, academic center, we have 30 minutes for each follow-up uh, patients in the movement disorder clinic. Um, and actually in the in neurology clinic in general, usually. In a private institution, I mean a private clinic or a non-academic center, let's put it that way, non-academic center, even 20 minutes or less. So very important that you be on time. The other important uh, thing here is to have a list of your medication with doses. Uh, are you taking any new medication? I would always going to ask you uh, if there is any new medication or I would be reviewing. Um, this is one of the first thing I do is just reviewing your medication list. Okay, this is very important. Uh, also uh, make sure that you uh, know your prior side effects uh, of, of medications, especially me uh, Parkinson medications. Make notes about those side effects. Very important to be honest with your doctor. If you, if you are not feeling well, say, speak up. We need to know. We need to know. This is very important. Um, typically, patients with Parkinson like to be in the best shape prior to doctor appointment. And they tend actually to deny and minimize their symptoms. They do not want to complain. Usually their spouse uh, complain more. Remember, better communication 
with your doctor and their staff means better outcomes for you. Very important. Now, you need to know and to learn about Parkinson's disease symptoms. Very important that you read about Parkinson's disease. You need to know your problem. You need to know your disease. Um, let me start with this. There are two types of Parkinson's disease symptoms, motor symptoms and the non-motor symptoms on your right. The motor symptoms are the one that everybody knows, everybody talk about it, uh, everybody pay attention to that. But the non-motor symptoms are really common and actually they are the one that affect your quality of life uh, significantly. In the future, we will have more um, we will discuss each one of these non-motor symptoms. Um, let's go back to the left here, the motor symptoms. So you need to have bradykinesia. Bradykinesia means, brady means slow, kinesia means movement, so a slow movement. This is a requirement in order to say that somebody has Parkinsonism. Otherwise, you don't have Parkinsonism, you don't have Parkinson's disease. You need to have bradykinesia, okay? This is a requirement. Um, and it's not just being slow, you need to be slow and you have to, and you need to have decrement in the amplitude and or speed of the movements, okay? So not everything that moves slow, not everything that looks slow is Parkinsonism, okay? Tremors, tremors are very common, but not universal. Not every patient with Parkinson's disease have tremors. Approximately 20 to 25% of the patients, they don't have tremors at all. And that doesn't mean that they don't have Parkinson's disease. Very important that you understand that because people associate tremors with Parkinson's disease all the time. And again, 20, 25% of the patients, they don't have tremors at all. Rigidity is a very common symptom. Almost every patient, they, they, they are rigid and it get activated when you move the opposite side of your body. Okay, but this is classic in the setting of Parkinsonism, Parkinson disease. Also, you have what, what we call postural instability. Instability. So um, that this is a balance problem, making you more likely to have a fall. So all of these uh, symptoms are the motor symptoms. Now, the non-motor symptoms are fatigue, pain, sleep problems, we are, which are many types of a sleep problem. The most common one is sleep fragmentation, waking up multiple times during the day, um, at night. Depression, anxiety, bladder problems, loss of interest, difficulty concentrating, excessive uh, sweating, multitasking and organizing daily activities, visual hallucinations, decreased sense of smell, which can be one of the most common one and the first one, uh, maybe even 10 years uh, before you start having your motor symptoms. Constipation is another one very common, which usually years before you start having motor symptoms as well. Um, lightheadedness due to dropping blood pressures, um, sexual dysfunction and drooling, okay? So remember that not every patient have all of those symptoms, okay? Uh, and not every patient is the same. So every patient is totally different. What doctors need to know to treat you better, okay? This is the type of question that, that they might be asking you and I will be asking you. Uh, and this is based on the Parkinson's disease quality measurement set update. Uh, Polish in 2015. So I need to know, I need to know, we need to ask you about, are you having psychiatric symptoms such as hallucinations, delusions? When I say delusions, I mean um, false belief, false beliefs not shared by others, okay? Um, depression, anxiety, apathy. Apathy means the lack of interest, of desire of doing things that you used to do before. Impulse control disorders, such as gambling, binge eating, 
very common side effect of dopamine agonist. Okay, very common side effect. Uh, we need to know about cognitive issues, mentation, memory problems. So, which means uh, especially multitask activities, having issues with that, poor attention, um, getting lost, um, difficulty finding the right word. Um, autonomic dysfunction, like dropping blood pressure, constipation, uh, urinary urgency, swallowing problems, dro drooling, and sexual dysfunction. Any sleeping problems, and this is a very common uh, uh, complaint. Daytime sleepiness, insomnia, sleep fragmentation, and acting out during your sleep, punching, kicking, moving a lot, screaming, having vivid dreams. Very common in Parkinson's disease. Uh, approximately 50 to 55% of the patient might have these issues of acting out during sleep. We call that in medical term, REM, REM, sleep behavior disorder. Um, restless leg syndrome, very common phenomenon affecting your sleep as well. Falling down, are you falling down? We need to know because we need to correct or protect you from the consequence of having falls leading to fractures, uh, especially hip fractures. Um, we need to check, if you're falling, that, falling down, we need to check if if we can find um, causes of neuropathy, such as vitamin B12 deficiency, if you have prediabetes or diabetes, uh, visual disturbance, uh, weakness uh, due to deconditioning, you are not doing exercises. Um, if, you, if you don't use it, you lose it. So overactive uh, uh, um, bladder make you, make you go into the bathroom to urinate, increasing the risk of you having a fall at night, so sometimes we need to send a home care service, PT and OT to evaluate safety issues at home, okay? Uh, make sure that before blaming balance issues causing you to fall down, you need to make sure that you are not having a drop in blood pressure. We call that orthostatic, orthostatic hypotension, low blood pressure, causing you to fall down because this is a very common cause of falling down in patient with Parkinson. And then we blame that, oh, patient is falling down because he, he patient, or she or he has Parkinson, balance issues and neuropathy, uh, but probably the cause of falling down is because the blood pressure is dropping, okay? So another important <clears throat> question that the, your Parkinson doctor will ask you is, are you doing exercises? Okay. Don't feel bad, bad about that. Um, but we need to know. Um, any motor complications such as wearing off, wearing off, which means that the medication, the levodopa, the dopaminergic medication, the medication that we give you for Parkinson is, is or are out of your system. Okay, out of your brain. So you are going to have more Parkinsonian symptoms. Um, dyskinesias, are you having dyskinesia? So all these questions are extremely important and very important that you talk about these things. And very important um, to discuss and to tell your doctor is, if you find out that these symptoms occur at a specific time, write it down, okay? Because that might be actually a, a off phenomenon related with the time that you take the levodopa, the retari or, or the cinnamon. Uh, for example, if you are having those symptoms um, one hour before the next pill, write it down. Because that might help me, help us to give you the correct uh, treatment. Okay. If you're having symptoms 45 minutes after the Retari after the cinnamon, then write it down because that might help us as well. Okay, very important that you write down the time and if there is any relationship with the levodopa dose. Now, <clears throat> very important that you understand the difference between dyskinesias 
and Parkinsonian tremor, okay? This is a tremor on the left of your screen. And let me play this. And these are dyskinesias, very important. Why, why this is important? Because when you call, and I have this problem multiple times in the office, when you call, and if you say that, oh, my tremors, doctor, my tremors are getting worse, and you are referring to this on your left of the screen, these actually are not tremors, these are actually are dyskinesia. So if you say that this is tremors, I will give you the incorrect treatment, the correct management, and your symptoms will get worse. So make sure that you are able to differentiate uh, uh, between these two phenomenologies, okay? These are dyskinesias in the setting of Parkinson's disease, and these are tremors, okay? Let's talk about a little bit about dyskinesia. <clears throat> So dyskinesia is one of the more complications in, in Parkinson's disease. So you need to have Parkinson's disease and you need to have levodopa in order to have dyskinesia like, uh, like that, okay? Um, rarely you might have dyskinesia in, in others, um, atypical uh, Parkinsonism, but we'll discuss that uh, later. And they, they look totally different, okay? Now, the dyskinesia in the setting of Parkinson's disease, they mostly look looks like this. We call that chorea or dancing type of movements. Um, I cannot predict where the movement are going. Uh, it's, it's like a flow of movement to from one side to another one. It's like dancing. So this is the most common one. And usually uh, uh, this patient, the right side is the side that has the most uh, Parkinsonian symptoms, which is more tremors here, more um, stiffness in here on the right side. So this is the side that you see usually more dyskinetic movements. So dyskinesia also might be abnormal posturing uh, as well, especially in the hands, okay? Um, <clears throat> when, when I say dyskinesia, there are many types of dyskinesia, but the most common one is the peak dose dyskinesia. So, which means that uh, you are having too much movement uh, because your medications are working and your dopamine receptors are too sensitive, too sensitive. So, this is what we think is the, the reason for dyskinesia. We are not completely clear about that, but the dopamine recept receptors after many years of having Parkinson's disease and using levodopa or cause your receptor to be very, very sensitive. Um, so so uh, when you are very, very on, this is how you look, okay? One detail here is that many patients with dyskinesia, they are not even aware that they have dyskinesia. It doesn't bother them at all. Bother more the people around them. Uh, uh, and sometimes you ask them, are you aware that you are moving like that? And they say, what are you talking about? I, I, oh, what movement are you talking about? So they are not even aware of that, okay? So sometimes uh, uh, the management in patients with mild dyskinesia is not doing anything, okay? Um, very important that you understand that not every symptom in Parkinson's disease require treatment only if the symptom is affecting your function, your quality of life, then you treat. Otherwise, don't treat it, okay? Um, now, let's talk about the tremors. <clears throat> tremors are extremely common in Parkinson's disease, right? Uh, I say that uh, approximately 75% of the patient, 80% uh, of the patient with Parkinson's disease, they have what we call Resting tremor, resting tremor. Tremors are divided in action and resting. Uh, but in Parkinson's disease, the predominant type of tremor is resting. So this patient on the left side of the screen, I told him to stop the levodopa, the cinemet, 12 hours, at least 12 hours prior before the next visit. So I, I, I was able to see him completely off off means that the medication is out of the brain, out of the system. 
So you see the significant amount of tremor on the right hand resting tremor. <clears throat> so this patient actually was not able even to walk when he's off. And believe me, I gave him 300 milligrams, so three pills of the carbidopa levodopa. And I um, took him back one hour after. And believe me, the tremors went away completely and the patient was able to walk and move better, okay? So this patient has an excellent response to levodopa and probably an uh, excellent candidate for deep brain stimulation as well. This is another topic that we will discuss later on. Um, very important, I want to tell you, please do not evaluate the effectiveness of levodopa based on the tremor. Why is that? Because I always tell patients that the levodopa, I mean, the, or, or actually all the medication that we use for, for, for Parkinson, except few uh, exceptions. Um, are better, work better for stiffness and slow movement, but not too much for the tremors. However, there are some patients, some very lucky patients, that the levodopa, the retired the CDMF, work as a charm very quick. Some of them don't even touch the tremor, okay? And that doesn't mean that you don't have Parkinson's disease or you have or you have one of the atypical uh, phenomena because your tremors are not responding to levodopa. So again, do not test the effectiveness of, of levodopa based on the tremor only, okay? The levodopa will be more effective for the stiffness uh, and the slow movements, okay? The tremors, so-so, mm, depends. And, and even though that your tremors are not responding to levodopa, that doesn't mean that you are not a candidate for deep brain stimulation, okay? So deep brain stimulation is very effective for tremors in the setting of Parkinson's disease, very effective. <clears throat> now, um, the bottom line here is be ready for these questions. Review the slide number seven. Um, very important that you understand uh, your motor symptoms and your non-motor symptoms. If your Parkinson doctor does not ask you about this question, bring them up, okay? Don't be afraid, just bring them up. If there's any issues, especially if there's any issue, you need to talk, you need to speak up. Otherwise, how can we help you, okay? Have a list of questions. I always tell patients or try to tell them to write down what is the most important problem that you want to discuss today, okay? One or two maybe three, okay? But have a little question. Otherwise you will forget. Uh, you will go home and I forgot to tell my doctor this. Okay. Always ask, don't be afraid of asking. That's why we are there, okay? Do not stay with the doubt. Learn all you can about your disease. Watch videos about, there are many YouTube videos. Uh, about Parkinson's disease. There are many. Watch, learn about Parkinson's disease. Um, you can go to the Parkinson Disease Foundation. There are excellent uh, uh, articles about Parkinson's disease and very easy to read and to understand. If you like this video, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much. See you soon.